Okay. Well. All right. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> oh, hello. Fancy seeing you here in this, my living room. Um, hi. Uh, th this is a video on my channel uh, uh, that wherein I talk about the physical media that's slowly dying away to make way for our digital overlords, the corporations. Yay! Welcome! Hello! Uh, so, Kino's having a sale. They're, yes, their March Madness sale. One of their 57 goddamn sales that occurs throughout the year. And, uh, yeah, I bought a few. Um, I actually have now, I've already ordered two shipments worth of Kino. And I say shipments like fucking, like, pallets. And I'm probably gonna order a third. I actually forgot which day it ends. Let's see here. On this, this date is when the March Madness sale in. So you have until then to order your, your March Madness stuff, you order your Kino Blu-rays and DVDs if you're still into the DVDs. And uh, yeah, I wanted to make this video to kind of give you my opinions on a few of the films that I watched. Um, I watched, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I watched 12 fucking movies and there's a bunch more that I didn't watch. And I just want to give you some ideas. And uh, I'm going to show you some fucking footage. Like, here's a, here's, a, here's a little clip. One day, I would like to give you a gift of a Colombian necktie. <laughs> Very special. You slit the throat, pull out the tongue, and I knew <laughs> it would look beautiful. Why don't you give it to me right now? Yeah, I have the power. Clip. Look, do we have to go over it? We almost got together, but we didn't. Hey, look at that. A magic. Let's do, uh, let's, uh, I want a curse word. Curse word! The fuck? <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, man. Uh, fuck you, future editor Michael. Uh, so, uh, let's just, I guess what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk about the stuff that I got that I haven't watched, and then I will talk about what I did watch in order from least to most liked. And we're just, very chill video. Normally I'd have a script or something. Nah, no fucking script here. Just a guy in his living room. Uh, as you can see behind me, I got a whole bunch of movies. That's just a small, small chunk of my collection. You might notice down here there's like nothing. And that's because I have a toddler. And so I have to start my <laughs> shelves higher than I normally would. Um, but uh, yeah, it's all disorganized. One day I'll do a video uh, showing you everything that I own. I'll do a whole collection tour. But right now it's a, it's a fucking mess. You got a coochie copy. Right back here, you got, right, like, behind my head, there's a fucking book right there. You got Beyond Terra, uh, Lucio Fulci book right there. Uh, these don't even belong here. These indicators, they don't belong there. They're not supposed to be there. Anyway, so, uh, yeah. Let's, uh, also, I'm using a little new lav mic. Let me know what you think. Hopefully, the quality doesn't suck. I'm hoping. Uh, anyway, so, uh, let's just dig in here. First off, The Long Riders. Now, this is a, a two-disc set, and I've had a lot of people say this is pretty dope. It is directed by the one and only Walter Hill of 48 Hours fame. Uh, let's see. It starts... Which one of brothers? It has David Carradine, Keith Carradine, Robert Carradine, G James Keach, Stacey Keach, Dennis Quaid, Randy Quaid, Christopher Guest, and Nicholas Guest. It's a, it's a multi-family affair. And, uh, yeah, new interviews with, like, everybody I just said, basically. Uh, with the director, uh, composer Rye Cooter. Cooter? Rye Cooter? Hate having a Rye Cooter. There's, a, there's an hour-long making of, uh, anatomy of a scene, uh, all kind of Walter Hill talking about Sam Peckinpah, audio commentary by some film historians, 5.1 surround, just, just good stuff. It's a brand new 4K restoration. It's a two-disc set, uh, and I'm actually really sad I didn't watch this one. I was kind of focusing on movies that were like 90 minutes or less as I watched, just so I could watch as many as possible. This one's 100 minutes, which is a small difference. I really probably could have watched it, but I'm very excited to, to dig into this one. I love a good Western, um, and that is on sale now. So super cheap, super cheap. Uh, Burn Witch Burn is also currently, they're all currently available, what am I saying? Uh, and just bear in mind, if these are, if they show as out of stock when you go to buy them, if you want to buy any of these and they are uh, temporarily out of stock when they go into your cart, just buy it, because they, they restock real fast. Don't don't you worry about it. Uh, my next shipment is delayed a little bit, but it'll be here in no time, I'm sure. Margaret's confessed that the whole thing was a lie. The lie! Everything's a lie to you, isn't it, Taylor? You're very familiar with lies. So this is Burn Witch Burn, and uh, Burn Witch Burn! So Burn Witch Burn, uh, I don't know anything about it, honestly. Uh, there's a brand new interview 
with the star Peter Wingard and an audio commentary by writer Richard Matheson. Uh, oh, right, yeah, uh, written by Richard Matheson. That, uh, that'll do it for me. Honestly, that's all I need to know. Richard Matheson, uh, of course, wrote I Am Legend and a lot of Twilight Zone and stuff. And I think this is also, yeah, Charles Beaumont, who was also a Twilight Zone writer, wrote this movie. And that's really all you need to know. Who cares about plot? It's written by Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont, as I said, Peter Wingard, uh, Janet Blair, and, uh, let's see, a natural skeptic, the woman is infuriated upon, oh wait, no, that's too far in. The powers of dark magic rule the night in this chilling masterpiece of supernatural horror as a college campus turns into a nest of evil. Was that enough for, for footage? Oh, fuck it, whatever. Uh, boom, all right. <laughs> and they want to kill us, but not too quick. Where'd they come from? From one lousy sock. Uh, Soldier Blue. This is one that Brian, one of my beautiful patrons, recommended to me. Stars Candace Bergen, Peter Strauss, and Donald Pleasance. Soldier Blue. Stained with the Blood of the Innocent. It is a satirical film, I believe. Sometimes the truth is lost in battle. From Ralph Nelson, the acclaimed director of Soldier in the Rain, Father Goose, Duel at... I don't care about any of that. Comes this graphic and uncompromising, uncompromising anti-racist western starring Candace Bergen. Peter Strauss and Donald Pleasance, I just said that, after a cavalry patrol is ambushed by the Cheyenne, uh, the two survivors, Honus Gent, a soldier highly devoted to his duty, and Cresta, a white woman who had lived with Native Americans for two years, must reach the safety of the nearest fort. As they travel, Honus feels a growing affection for Cresta, but he is disgusted that her sympathies lie more with the Cheyenne than the U.S. government. Okay, I see where you're going, Soldier Blue. Um, so yeah, another one I didn't watch. This is from 1970. Uh, it has an audio commentary by some film historians, and yeah, I really have nothing else to say other than uh, I'm, I'm intrigued. I've heard good and bad things, but uh, you know, it's uh, a recommendation from a patron, and I always take those very seriously. So, uh, by the way, you can join the Patreon now, link below in the description. Hey, yeah. Whenever I wake up, beautiful girl, I uh, always give her breakfast. All right, so uh, let's see, female on the beach. I bought this one because, what was it? I think it's in here. Um... Blah, blah, blah. Screen legend Joan Crawford stars as Lynn Markham, a widow who moves into a beach house where the former owner had fallen to her death. What had seemed like an accident turns into uh, turns to suspicion of murder as Lynn finds herself drawn into a torrid affair with a handsome beachcomber who may be harboring a sinister secret. Uh, wonderfully directed by Joseph Pevney. Let's see. It's a stylish showcase for Crawford's intense performance. Features a stellar cast. Okay. In the description on Kino, or maybe it was Blu-ray.com, one of them, they described it as sleazy, and I heard Joan Crawford and sleazy, and I was down to clown. Also, there are two there are two audio commentaries. Uh, one by David DeValle, or however the fuck you say his name, uh, moderated by David Dakota. That's exciting. And then the other one by Cat Ellinger. So that is, like, good shit. Like, that right there grabs me by the shorties and just pulls... Uh, so I'm very excited about that one. Uh, I don't really know Joseph Pevney's other films, but sick, you know? It's a sleazy movie starring Joan Crawford and Jeff Chandler. That, enough to sell me. Female on the Beach! All right, so let's see here. Uh, let's just do, uh, real fast. Uh, Man in the Shadow with Orson Welles. Please. He's pretty mean, but uh, he keeps visitors away. <laughs> the unwelcome ones, of course. Uh, I saw it was an Orson Welles movie uh, from 1957, and I was all about it. Let's see here. We got uh, it's uh, directed by Jack Arnold. Uh, he he directed It Came from Outer Space, so pretty. So oh, and Creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, so pretty solid pedigree right off the bat, and uh, stars Jeff Chandler eh? and Orson Welles. And I know literally nothing about. I'm not even going to read the plot synopsis. Uh, you know, I'm showing you some clips right now, but I'm not going to read it because I want to go in as surprised as possible. Um, or is fresh, but it does have an audio commentary by film historian Troy Howarth, who literally wrote the book on Jalo films. So, uh, Jack Arnold, audio commentary of Troy Howarth, beautiful black and white cinematography based on what I've heard. Fuck yeah, man. Man in the Shadow. The third man in the shadow. All right. So, let's see here. We got Spetters. This is an early Paul Verhoeven film that's really, uh, and has Rutger Hauer, uh, and an audio commentary on the disc by director Paul Verhoeven. If you watch my streams, you know, I love a good commentary. Commentaries are all, it's the only way that I can, you know, spurt. Uh, the only way, ah, oh, I missed that. It's the only way I can spetter. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Paul Verhoeven, who of course directed my favorite movie of all time, Robocop. 
can't wait. Spetas. Uh, Black Sabbath. Uh, now this one kind of bugs me. This is uh, this is one. Uh, I love Black Sabbath. Uh, I love anything Mario Bava touches. Really, uh, that's a strong way of putting it. I love most things that Mario Bava touched. Uh, but Black Sabbath, Sabbath is great for a number of reasons. For one, it's one of Mario Bava's best films. It's one of the greatest anthology films of all time. Uh, and it even is an early giallo in a way. One of the segments technically works as a giallo. So it is a, a fantastic film. Uh, it's very important to the history of horror movies. It stars Boris Karloff as well. And it's visually very exciting. That being said, uh, this is the Italian version. Now, that you can get two versions from Kino. You can get the Italian version, and you can get the uh, AIP version. So basically, AIP, uh, they bought the rights for the U.S. Uh, and maybe other markets, I don't really remember, but mainly the U.S. market. Uh, and they decided to recut and rescore the film. So it's a totally different score from what Mario Bava intended. Uh, and then also, for some reason, they switched some of the segments around, and it, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work quite as well. That being said, both versions are great. I cannot, I'm not going to denigrate either version, but I went with the Italian cut. The only problem with the Italian cut, and this drives me fucking crazy, is it does not have any of the special features. All of the special features are on the AIP cut. Now, both of them are available. I believe they're each $10, so combined, they're the cost of a normal Blu-ray. Uh, you could do that. Looking back, I might have just waited for the Arrow sale and bought the Arrow version because it includes both cuts, uh, but, you know... Whatever. Uh, I, I, I love Black Sabbath. I decided to buy it. I was looking at screen caps, and I preferred the um, transfer on this version, but it's not a huge difference. So if you really want both cuts, I would just wait for the arrow. However, super cheap. So uh, Next up, uh, Annie Lucasta. So this is one I actually really wanted to watch, and I just ran out of time. It stars Eartha Kitt and Sammy Davis Jr. That's all I needed. I, I saw 1958 black and white film. Oh, and also, I didn't even think about this, written by Philip Jordan, who did the Big Combo. Big Combo is a great film noir, and it's used a lot by cinematographers when they're talking about lighting, because it is a very well-shot film, which has nothing to do with Philip Jordan, because he, he wrote it. But either which way, uh, directed by Arnold Laven, um, who I do not know the work of. But uh, yeah, it stars Eartha Kitt and Sammy Davis Jr., and I, you know... Here's a kid of Eartha Kitt acting with Sammy Davis Jr. Two kids out to get out, kicks into hell with tomorrow. That's the only way to live. What are you planning to do? Spend your life married to some guy who kisses you goodbye at breakfast and goes off to the office while you stay at home baking pies? Then he comes back and plays the fiddle to you? That's horrible. Rudolph isn't a bit like that. Rudolph? Wow, I bet that was good. I, I haven't watched it yet, but I bet it was good. Uh, this next one's a Code Red release, The Great Alligator. It's a Sergio Martino flick, uh, and it's, uh, I think it's a Jaws ripoff, maybe? Let's see, what year was this? This was... Don't see the year. Why don't they have the year on this? Come on, Code Red. Give me a fucking break. Either which way. Um, great Alligator, Sergio Martino. I will watch anything that Sergio Martino makes. And uh, I especially love a good alligator or crocodile movie. I mean, crocodiles are better because alligators are kind of like, you know, just pussy versions of crocodiles. But either which way. It's wonderful. Come on in. Even if you shit on yourself, no one's going to see it in here. <laughs> I, uh, I'm really excited to, to watch this, even though it is a Code Red release. I do have a bit of a problem with Code Red because Banana Man, but so far, the Code Red releases that I've watched in this pile have not featured Banana Man in any force, forceful way. So, here's hoping that's the case here, but it's a 2016 HD Master. Extensive, I love, it always says extensive color correction done in the U.S. on these Code Red discs, and I don't really know what that means. Um, it doesn't, it does I don't care that it was color corrected in the US. There are great color correction facilities everywhere. It's not that, like, it's not like a spec, US made doesn't, doesn't mean anything about color correction. But done in the US, uh, interview with underwater camera operator Gian Lorenzo Battaglia. Uh, round table discussion with uh, a bunch of stuff. I had a great time talking about this with my friend James, James Nickerson. He was in uh, both of my movies. We actually did a thing, and you, if you're a patron, you've seen the clip. And, uh, I only, we, sadly, when we recorded it, um, well, I, I looked at the footage and it looked like, it looked and sounded like, uh, this. Which, you know, not conducive to a well-liked video. So, uh, we wound up with only, like, four or five minutes of usable footage, because we did two 
separate takes and uh, the one take was a was a, a redo of something and that take was fine but the entire like near hour long take that we did prior to that absolute garbage so uh, but I, we had, I had a lot of fun just mispronouncing Italian names hopefully I'll be able to do that again soon but uh, until then got Claudio Marbito Massimo Antonella Gelling Sergio Martino, all kinds of people interviewed for this release. I'm very excited. Love me a good alligator movie. Uh, Mumford. I don't know anything about Mumford. Uh, has Alfred Woodward in it? Alfred Woodward, Jesus Christ. Has Alfred Woodard in it, uh, as well as a few others. Uh, it's written and directed by Lawrence Kasdan. Great, great filmmaker. Uh, most of the time. Um, you know, I don't know about, you know, Grand Canyon's a bit, uh, <laughs> but uh, has a bunch of people in it. Killing Jason Lee, Martin Short, Priscilla Bonds, Elizabeth Moss, Zoe Deschanel. Yeah, uh, it's a drama type thing, I guess. I don't, I don't, I don't know nothing about Mumford. I just kept seeing it. And I decided to fucking buy it. Uh, has an interview with Lawrence Kasdan, making up featurette. Nothing too crazy, but I'm intrigued. Uh, yeah, just check out my letterbox, and I'm sure I'll, re I'll, I'll you know, give it a rating at some point. All right, so now uh, that's everything that I did not watch. Now let's really quickly dive through, dive through, delve through, whatever, uh, the movies that I uh, did watch. I'm going to do this relatively fast because I am making this pretty quickly. The air conditioning just started above me, so this is a great test of this microphone to see if it picks that up. Probably will, because it's loud as fuck. Um, so, uh, I do have, uh, I'm, I'm watching some Vinegar Syndrome movies with some of my patrons on the Discord. Uh, so once again, if you want to become a patron, you can check that out down below. And, uh, so I need to hurry up, because I gotta, I gotta get ready for that, that movie watching with those, with those fucks. So, uh, let's, uh, let's, okay. Uh, so starting at the worst, uh, I'm just gonna say right now, I, I don't, I, I recommend all of these for purchases. These first two, they got a bit of an asterisk next to them. Uh, but, uh, first up, Billy the Kid versus Dracula. All right, so Billy the Kid vs. Dracula is well known as one of the worst goddamn movies of all time, and it's really not. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good time. It's not bad. Uh, it was the last film, fe last feature film directed by William Bodine. William Bodine, his career dates all the way back to the fucking silent film era, and he has he directed so many. Like, look at the guy's fucking IMDb. It is ridiculous. The man made so many fucking movies, and it it's staggering. And of course. Long, long career ends with Billy the Kid versus Dracula and some like TV shows. Traveling by stagecoach, Dracula, the great John Carradine, plots to convert Billy the Kid's famous stuntman Chuck Courtney, fiance Be Betty Bitley, Melinda Casey, into his vampire bride. When the sinister bloodsucker kidnaps Betty and takes her to an abandoned silver mine, Billy must confront the Count but soon realizes his six shooter's bullets are no match for the undead and an all-out battle of good versus evil ensues. Ah, uh, yeah, so I I had a good time with this. I would not say that it is an amazing film. I think it's very much a party movie, in that I think if you watch it with some friends, you'll have a better time than watching it by yourself. Uh, I did briefly listen to a little bit of the Lee Gambin and John Harrison commentary, and it seemed pretty good and informative. I can't say overall how good it was, because I did not watch, I, I listened to like 10 minutes. Uh, but they seem like knowledgeable dudes, and they seem to have a good rapport, and that's all I can really ask for in a commentary. The film itself is dumber than a bag of bricks. I am not entirely sure that this version of Dracula is harmed by daylight. I was very confused by that, because there's a lot of scenes that are meant to be nighttime, very obviously meant to be nighttime, but they are shot in broad fucking daylight. I don't know. I don't know. So, uh... Yeah, it's 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 dumber than a sack of bricks again, but it is fun. John Carradine mugs for the camera. According to him, this is the worst movie he ever made. I disagree. If you like Al Adamson movies, then this is this isn't the same thing, but this is uh, similar as far as skill on display. Uh, it it you know it 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 could be more ludicrous, but it does have plenty of weird bullshit. I'm like ninety percent certain that at one point when he's in bat form. Dracula has like a little hat, and then when he transforms into John Carradine, he has the top hat. I don't know if that was just like the film playing tricks in my eyes, but you know, that, yes. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Billy Kid vs. Dracula. I, I, I do recommend it 
just with the asterisk that it is not a necessarily good film, but it is entertaining and it is pretty weird. It's also only 73 minutes, so it's a pretty pretty quick ride. So, next up, Wanted Dead or Alive. Uh, this is from Gary Sherman. Now, Gary Sherman, uh, he directed Dead and Buried, which is coming to 4K from Blue Underground very soon, and I'm super fucking excited about. Uh, I love Dead and Buried. It's one of, it's, it's, and I, it's always weird to say this, but it's one of those films that influenced me as a filmmaker uh, quite a bit when I was younger. I love that movie. I, I owned, actually, I think the original DVD from Blue Underground, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't know whatever happened to that thing, but anyway, the point is, Gary Sherman, Really solid director. He does have his flaws. Uh, I saw one reviewer say that a lot of his films come off kind of cold. Um, and I, I, I think I agree with that. He does not... He, he, when a film clicks with Gary Sherman, it really clicks. When it doesn't click, it feels very kind of not... It doesn't feel as engaging. You know, this is a... It's a Rutger Hauer film. Rutger Hauer, I love Rutger Hauer. Like, he's my boy. I love him. Uh, it's not his first time in this giant pile, uh, but as good as he is, I wouldn't necessarily say, necessarily say that he works perfectly in this role. He's obviously a man in his 40s, uh, and he does not look very good in his outfit. He looks like a, like an old man playing dress up, basically. I just I like I'm I'm I, I'm not even sure that this. Blu-ray give like gets across exactly what kind of movie this is. Near the end, it says, um, "Blah blah blah." Co-star in this action-packed thriller, which features a final showdown that critics and fans alike call one of the most explosive climaxes of the '80s. And what? It's <laughs> it's a very it's a very lukewarm finale. Like there is, I'll give them this. There, the final explosive moment is really good. Is it one of the most explosive climaxes of the 80s? No. No, it is not. It is most definitely not. Uh, this is a film that manages to underutilize Gene Simmons, who, was a, who played a lot of villains uh, back in the 80s. He plays an Iranian terrorist, which, you know, he's Israeli. That's uh, kind of close, I guess. Um, it's not the most... It, you know, it's an 80s movie dealing with Middle Eastern terrorists. Your mileage will vary. Uh, Rutger Hauer plays a bounty hunter who, you know, just does not take any shit. And has one of the weirdest um, tragedies occur to him in this film. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it, but like, there's a point where something really bad happens, and that, of course, leads to him wanting vengeance. And you can probably see it coming a mile away when you actually watch the film. Uh, and all I could think was, that's kind of your fault. Like, you, you did that. This is you. This is all on you. You could have... You... Mm, uh, it's, it's a very, it's a weird script. It's, the direction is fine. It's not great. It's not bad. It's fine. Uh, what there is though, is there's a lot of macho 80s bullshit, which I'm always a fan of. Uh, when Gene Simmons is on screen, he is pretty good. He's not, he's not, he's not runaway good, but he's, he's good. A big problem with this is it is a fairly inexpensive film trying to be a big action flick. And really, there's not a whole lot of action in it when it comes right down to it. A lot of the uh, explosions, which, I mean, he's dealing with a terrorist who is blowing up shit all over the place. And you just, like, hear about it on TVs and stuff. A lot of the explosions do not occur on screen. He's creating chaos. It's a diversion. Which is kind of a big deal. You know, maybe, maybe rewrite your script if you can't afford to show a bunch of explosions in the movie about a terrorist who's blowing everything up. Just saying. Gives us a place to start. Yeah. It's weird. It's a weird film. Uh, do I dislike it? No. Do I like it? Kinda. Uh, it does have audio commentary by director Gary Sherman and uh, executive, executive producer Arthur M. Sarkeesian. Uh, I think an interview with Gary Sherman, interview with Mel Harris. Uh, you know, it's, it's a good package. It is, I, don't, I don't think it's bad. Uh, it's weird. It, if you didn't know, it's a sequel to the 50s uh, Western series starring Steve McQueen. And the idea is that Rutger Hauer is, I think, his great-grandson? Um, maybe it's just his grandson. It doesn't matter. Uh, he's, a, he's a... Like, that's the connection. Uh, it doesn't take place in the same fucking state or the same time period. It really has nothing to do with the series it's based on, other than he's a bounty hunter 
and t- they ha- he has the same last name. And at one point, he talks about uh, Steve McQueen's character. Uh, that's it. That's everything you got. It's so weird. It's so fucking weird. Um, and it's a little underwhelming, but when it's really good, it's great. When it's bad, it's kind of ugh. But uh, still, not a bad film. Has plenty going for it. Devil Times 5! Woo, baby! Devil Times 5. I, I wanted to pick this up for the longest time. It is a Code Red Blu-ray. Got me a knife! Luckily, no Banana Man in this parts that in the in, as part of the feature. That's great. I hate when Banana Man shows up before my movie. Uh, let's see. It's a 2K scan, audio commentary by actors Joan McCall and Don Lynn with producer producers Mickey Blowitz and David Sheldon, moderated by Darren Gross. Uh, and then there's a featurette with some of the actors as well. This is a, a bit of a mishmash. So this is a film that uh, they shot part of the movie and they had to reshoot some of the movie. And it makes it very, it's, all, it's, it's very sloppy in its execution because of the whole thing. Uh, 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 oh, what's his name? Uh, Leif Garrett. Leif Garrett was in this movie right at the beginning of his uh, popularity. And he has long hair in the film. And when he left, when they finished the initial shoot, he cut his hair for another production. And then when they brought him back, of course, he had short hair all of a sudden. And so they gave him a wig, and then they they it, they integrated that <laughs> into the plot, uh, and made him like uh, a crossdresser, I guess. It's really weird. It doesn't like play into the plot at all, other than just adding more scenes. But at one point, he actually takes off uh, his wig to reveal his short hair. But we've seen him with totally natural long hair throughout m- large chunks of the film. It it's it's dumber than a bag of dicks, but it's so fun. It's very good. My biggest qualm with it, really, is that it's just kind of sloppy. And uh, I wouldn't say the... It, it's a little slow. I think that's what I... like. It, it takes a while to build up. Once it gets to the back half, it's fucking bonkers banana pants. But there are long stretches of not a whole lot happening. Uh, also, uh, I don't remember her name, but uh, uh, Leif Garrett's mother is in this film uh, as one character. And holy shit, his mom was fucking hot. Also, uh, Sorrel Book, who played Boss Hogg in, in uh, Dukes of Hazard, is in this. Uh, you got Shelley Morrison of Will and Grace fame. It's uh, if you like to watch children do bad things, Devil Times Five. Uh, it's about a group of kids who their bus uh, they have a, they're in a bus bus crash, and they find a bunch of people who are at this like house lodge thing, and they just you know bad things happen, and the kids are fucking nuts, <laughs> and it's weird as shit. Uh, if that sounds like your bag, go ahead and get it. Like, if you like movies that have a troubled production history, you ha- that's you got that going for you. If you like killer kid movies, you got that going for you. And if you just like a lot of weird choices that don't seem to make a lot of sense, you got that going for you. And I personally love all of those things. Uh, so Double Times Five, hearty recommend, just not as good as a bunch of other movies in this pile. Uh, the next one is actually just, i given it just a slight edge on Devil Times 5, partly because it is a more just traditionally good film, and that is Chuck Norris in Code of Silence. Talk, asshole. Uh, Audio commentary by director Andrew Davis, who did The Fugitive Baby and Under Siege. Uh, Interview with screenwriter Michael Butler, interview with composer David Michael Frank, uh, interviews with uh, Ron Dean and Molly Hagen. It's no Lone Wolf McQuaid, but Code of Silence is really good. Um, I was honestly like, I'm, I'm in a bit of a like Chuck Norris um, binge recently, uh, and I, I'm really enjoying everything I'm watching. Uh, I never took Chuck Norris's movies that seriously. I still don't, but I do find them very fun to watch. Chuck Norris, unlike a lot of his contemporaries, he didn't, like, keep it up. Uh, it helps that he's older. I think he's the oldest of the 80s action heroes. Uh, yeah, because he's, like, 80 now, and I don't think any of the other ones are 80, so, yeah. And he didn't, like, try to become a sex symbol like Steven Seagal. Uh, he doesn't seem like he was particularly arrogant like Jean-Claude Van Damme. And, you know, he didn't really reach the... He didn't reach the, the, the acting heights of, say, a Sylvester Stallone or an Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
Uh, he didn't try to diversify that much. You know, there were sidekicks, but he didn't really try too hard to go beyond his comfort zone. And there's something nice about that, you know? Like, there's something that's really cool about a guy who knows what he does, and he does it well, and that's it. You know, he has that, like, specific Chuck Norris stare. He has that specific Chuck Norris cadence, and he can fight real good. And that's all, that's all he does. Nothing else. Nothing else. Uh, and I like that. And, the, like, directors like Andrew Davis knew how to direct Chuck Norris. They knew to surround him with quality actors. You know, in this case, uh, we got a very early role from Dennis Farina uh, before he became a kind of a, a much bigger star, before he did Crime Story. And he was just, you know, he was... It was when he was, you know, just that, that Chicago cop who was showing up in movies and TV. And he's really solid. Henry Silva plays the villain. Henry Silva, Silva is amazing. Also still alive somehow, which shocked me when I found out he's still alive. Um, good for him. Good for him. But Henry Silva plays a real motherfucker of a villain. That guy is a... That guy, that guy is kind of a cunt. Um, and it's, it's aggressively violent pretty mean-spirited a lot of times. Like, the gang warfare that occurs in this movie, very mean-spirited. Uh, and it's basically, it's your standard issue, just, you got this cop, and he's a lone wolf, and he doesn't want to, he doesn't need a, a sidekick, because he's Chuck fucking Norris. Except for at one point, he's in a fight with a robot, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and he's going to go up against these rival drug gangs who are just causing terror in Chicago. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he fights a bunch of people, a lot of people die, uh, there's, an uh, interesting little thread about police brutality that, you know, I think works pretty well. Uh, it, it does range wildly between dramatic and goofy, but I, overall, I enjoyed it, um, and it really is a testament to the kind of action star that Chuck Norris was. Uh, he doesn't even have a love interest in this movie. Uh, you'd think he would, like most action movies of the 80s, you had to have a love interest of some kind. Not in this case, no sir. Uh, his act Actually, his main relationship, his main female relationship, is very paternal. Say what you will about his politics, Chuck Norris, really solid action star. So, Code of Silence, good shit. It's a little all over the place tonally, but uh, really just solid film. Catch you later. Diabolical Dr. S Dr. Z. Uh, by Jess Franco. This one, uh, I feel like a lot of people would probably put this under the previous two, but I love Jess Franco. Uh, this is basically... Well, I'll, I'll, just read the, I'll just read the thing. A stylish medical horror thriller that brings to mind the work of Georges Franjou and David Cronenberg, The Diabolical Dr. Z is a vitally important film in the horror cinema's transition from spooky scares to a more dreamy and erotic variety that would become the signature of Spanish-born filmmaker Jess Franco. Mabel Carr stars as Irma Zimmer, the daughter of a visionary scientist who has developed a morbid system of mind control. After the slightly mad doctor's death, Irma carries on her father's work and uses a telepathically controlled exotic dancer with poisoned fingernails as an instrument of revenge upon three doctors who mocked Dr. Z's theories. But can Irma eliminate the names on her list before a pair of detectives, played by Franco and the film's composer, Daniel White, expose her plot? Uh, yeah, it's just as wild as it sounds. Beautiful cinematography. It, it's a great example of what could have been, because of course, Jess Franco, he did not get as much uh, money as he deserved throughout his career. He did not get the kind of projects he deserved. He made a lot of good shit and a lot of bad shit. But, you know, that he's the kind of filmmaker who I really wish had been given more big-budget productions, just because I'd like to see what he would have done. And this is a good example. It's not a big-budget movie, but it's beautifully shot. I think this is his last black-and-white film. It's also, it's kind of a, like, sidequel to his uh, Orloff series. They mentioned Dr. Orloff, but he's not actually a character. Although, Howard Vernon, who played Dr. Orloff, is in this as a different character. You know, it's stylish, it's fun, it's silly. There's some makeup effects that don't quite work, but they're kind of fun in a kitschy way. Uh, some quality murders happen. It's just a good time. If you like Just Franco movies, it's a must-have. If you don't like Just Franco movies, ignore this entry. All right. Uh, Seven Bloodstained Orchids. Bada-bing, bada-boom. Uh, it's a giallo, directed by Umberto Lenzi. It's a Code Red release that does not force you to watch Banana Man before the film. 
fucking recommend. Uh, yeah, a maniac on the loose is committing savage acts of slaughter, and one survivor may be the only key to unmasking the serial slayer known as the Half Moon Killer. The mysterious Half Moon lockets could be the only key to unraveling his sinister motives, but will that be enough before he completes his ice cold plot to claim his intended seven victims? Uh, it's based on a murder mystery novel by Edgar Wallace, uh, who was a big part of the Jala movement. Uh, well, his work was a big part of the Jalo movement. It's it's a fantastic Jalo, great mystery. I actually, I did guess, this is one of the few times I've actually guessed the killer in a Jalo before, and I was shocked by that. But uh, it was also kind of nice. It was nice to be right. Uh, and I think it was a it was a good twist. It's, you know, it, it's fairly straightforward Jalo fare, but it's well shot, has some really brutal kills, and it's, you know, you got characters that you enjoy watching. And that's all you can really ask for from a Jalo film. If you love Jalo films, but you haven't watched this one before, check it out. Uh, it does have uh, a new HD scan, color correction done in the US. Uh, you got the Italian and English tracks, brand new interview with director Lin uh, Umberto Lenzi, uh, audio commentary by Troy Howarth, vintage interview with Umberto Lenzi and Gabriella Giorgelli. Fucking hell yeah, man. That's all I gotta say. One million years BC. Uh, I'm kind of on a hammer kick right now, so I had to buy this. Uh, it's classic film. I actually, I realized after I watched this one on Letterboxd, and there are a lot of people trashing this movie, and I don't know why. I love One Million Years B.C. It's a really good film. Of course, it has Raquel Welch in her, uh, very... That's a baby. So, of course, that stars Raquel Welch in her, her fur animal skin bikini that's very popular. Helped a lot of kids through puberty back in the, uh, 60s. And uh, also John Richardson, who really is the main character in the film. And uh, it's a 4K restoration of the 91-minute U.S. cut. I don't know how much the restoration differs between that and the international cut, because I watched the international cut. Or here's, here's the same clip side-by-side side, uh, of the international cut and the uh, U.S. cut. So you can see the difference, if there is any. And uh, yeah, audio commentary by Tim Lucas. Uh, interview with Raquel Welch, interview with Ray Harryhausen, uh, actress uh, Martine Beswick, who's gorgeous. Love, love Martine Beswick. Uh, and again, film com it's a you know commentary by Tim Lucas. Can be a little boring sometimes. It really just depends, but he is a phenomenal uh, talent when it comes to just no one shit about movies. So you know I can't really say anything negative about that. I love I love this movie. It has some amazing Ray Harryhausen work. Uh, a lot of really just beautiful imagery. Uh, and it's a nice story. It's a nice, tightly done story. I don't know what, what else to say. Uh, it's about cave people, and it's totally inaccurate as to, you know, the actual history of cave people, and in this one they live with dinosaurs and shit, but that doesn't matter. It's fun. It's weird. It's kind of pulpy. It's a good time. I know a place that has the greatest water chestnuts in town. If you can stand water chestnuts. I'm mad about them. Let's go. All right. All right, The Bigamist. I have very little to say about this. It's an Ida Lupino film. Uh, it's the only time she directed herself in a movie. She's great. Joan Fontaine is great. Uh, who's the guy? Uh, Edmund O'Brien is really good. He's credited. It's uh, <laughs> Edmund, Edmund O'Brien as The Bigamist, which is one of the greatest credits you could possibly have in a film. Uh, it's a new 4K restoration. It looks really good. Uh, the Bigamist is public domain, so this is something you can definitely find and watch for free before you buy. Uh, it's a tightly done story. It's very simple. Literally just traveling salesman who has two families, well, two wives, a uh, baby with one. And the whole film is basically just him explaining to this investigator how he came into becoming a bigamist. And uh, it's a lovely story. Someone called it romantic. Uh, I saw some review called it romantic. I guess it's kind of romantic when he's uh, like falling for Ida Lupino's character, but uh, I, I don't know that a movie about a bigamist is all that romantic. It's also kind of, it's a, to me, it's a tragic story, and uh, I think it works really well. Beautiful film. Ida Lupino, phenomenal filmmaker. She has a bunch of movies available for sale. Uh, I'm actually probably just going to go ahead and pick up the rest before the sale ends, but uh, they, I think they're all on sale. Either all or most of the ones available through Kino are on sale, so I highly recommend picking up some Ida, Ida, Ida Lupino joints. Uh, next up, we're getting a little, little long-winded here, so let's just let's get through this real fast. Uh, Baby Blood. Uh, it's a French film about a, a, an alien fetus that's inside of a woman, and she likes to fuck, and 
Uh, it likes to drink blood, and those two things coalesce nicely. Uh, it's weird as shit. It's very art. Well, it's, it's not very art. It's a little artsy. Emmanuel Escaro is uh, banging, <laughs> to say the very least. And if you if you like titties, uh, there's just a lot of just straight up nudity in this movie, and it's really kind of it's it's weird and wacky. Tonally, it's kind of all over the place, but that's kind of my bread and butter. You got an audio commentary by Lee Gambin and film critic Jarrett Gahan. Um, you get uh, French and English audio. English audio, the fetus uh, is dubbed by Gary Oldman. So there you go. That's reason enough to buy. You realize I could be born deformed? No. You hate me, don't you? Some very gory effects, a lot of violence. If you like blood and gore and nudity, but you like like, like a little bit of French to make it feel like nice and artistic, like it's okay to be watching this because, you know, you're, 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 you're a high-class individual. Um, baby blood. It's fucking great. Uh, next up, the Spiral Staircase. Uh, Spiral Staircase is just really, really good. Uh, it is a black and white film from 1946, and it is a thriller with a, a, a almost like a, almost like slasher giallo-ish element to it. Like, I could see this remade in the 70s in Italy as a giallo, and you would have to change very little. Our main character uh, is mute throughout most of the film. And uh, well, I'll, just, I'll just give you a, I'll give you a quick summary from the back. Also, uh, 4K scan. One of the all-time great Hollywood chillers, a murderer, is targeting disabled women in a New England town. And Helen, a mute servant in a gothic mansion, is terrified she's next. Mrs. Warren, the invalid, bullying mistress of the house, warns Helen to leave at once, rather than rely on her weak son and stepson for protection. But even as Helen is packing her things, she suspects she may be too late, and the murderer is closer than she ever imagined. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic. Produced by David O. Selznick, directed by uh, Robert Siodmak, or Siodmak. It's Siodmak, I remember now. Yeah, you say, you say it's Siodmak. Uh, I've never seen any of his other stuff. I'm definitely going to buy some more of his movies because I really want to watch them after watching this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Audio commentary by Imogen, Imogen Sarah Smith. Uh, 1945 Screen Directors Playhouse Radio broadcast of the Spiral Staircase. Uh, you know, could be bigger with the tr with the special features, but give me one commentary. I'm good, to be honest with you. Um, beautiful cinematography. Like, you could learn a lot watching this movie. Just the shots of the titular staircase. Fantastic. Um, it, this almost, almost all of it takes place in this one house, and they find all kinds of great ways to shoot inside here without it ever feeling stale. Uh, there's a good bit of humor to the film, which is nice to have. Uh, it kind of breaks up the tension. Uh, but when it gets tense, especially those last, like, I'm going to say, like, half hour. Oh, my God. So good. Um, so, real, let's get, uh, almost done. X, the man with X-ray eyes. Uh, this is actually an old favorite of mine. I, I've always enjoyed this film. I remember when I first heard about this movie in Leonard Maltin's Movie Guide. And I was so excited to see it. And then I finally saw it, I think, on DVD. And uh, I had such a good time and it became an instant favorite. And it has aged very well. It is a great film. It feels like an episode of The Twilight Zone, but directed by Roger Corman. And yeah, Roger Corman directed the movie. And he's, he's such a good director. And I, uh, I love it. It's, it's weird. It's about a guy who creates a formula to see through shit. And unfortunately, that comes with some unintended consequences. Uh, yeah. I'm not, when brilliant Dr. Xavier concocts a serum to improve human sight, he stumbles upon a formula for x-ray vision, inspired by its awesome medical potential, but shunned by his short-sighted colleagues. Short-sighted colleagues, I got that. Uh, the doctor tests the, the potion on himself, only to discover that his ability to see through walls, clothing, and flesh is slowly eclipsed by an insatiable desire to look still further. There's a typo here. It says, and insatiable desire, but it should be and. Guys, come on. Proofread. Even if it means more than any mortal can bear. Featuring wonderful direction by the great Roger Corman and a strong supporting cast. Blah, 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 blah. Watch it. It's very fucking great. It's a great science fiction film from the 60s. Film, you're looking at clips right now. It looks fucking great, right? Uh, Terror Vision. Uh, uh, legendary director Joe Dante on X. Audio commentary by Roger Corman. Fuck yeah. Audio commentary by Tim Lucas. Double fuck yeah. Uh, rare prologue, and then Trailers from Hell with Mick Garris. Fucking watch the, buy the fucking movie. Super cheap. And finally, last but not least, 
my number one pick, and this surprised the fuck out of me. My peer on YouTube, Aaron Penn, uh, suggested this to me during a live stream of his. And uh, he specifically said it would suit my sensibilities. And God damn it, he was right. Starring Armand DeSante, Barbara Carrera, uh, and a bunch of other fucks. I, the Jury is one of my new favorite movies. It is completely wackadoo bullshit. It's so stupid. It's, of course, based on the novel by Mickey Spillane and it, uh, featuring Armand DeSante as Mike Hammer, famous noir detective character. Mike Hammer, famously played by Stacey Keach in the, in the TV series. And uh, it's so horny. Um, it was a film, it was, it was written by Larry Cohen and it was partially directed by Larry Cohen, but he was taken off the project and he was replaced by a TV director, uh, Richard, uh, yeah, Richard T. Heffron. And, you know, on the one hand, I, it doesn't make me sad that he did not direct the entire film. It would have been great if he had. But, holy shit, it still is a Larry Cohen written film. It's super sleazy, super skeezy. And, like, it, it's violent. There's full of sex and nudity and just weird shit in this version uh mike hammer is a i think a, he's a vietnam vet and you know it's it's updated for the 80s it's no longer a a 40s noir story and uh yeah i i really just had a great time i'll just give you a quick summation and then we'll be out of here the tough guy hero of the 40s and the excitement of the 80s come together in this dazzling remake of the classic mickey spillane thriller i the jury straight from the school of the hard-boiled detective comes private eye mike hammer played by the ruggedly sexy Armand Asante. Hammer sets out to get the guys who did his friend who did in his fr Hammer sets out to get the guys who did in his friend Jack. His quest for vengeance leads him onto the paths of the CIA, a sexy doctor and a kinky killer. All along the way there are spectacular chases and incredible excitement. Richard T. Heffron direct Future World uh, directed this first-rate action-packed thriller with a screenplay by Larry Cohen and a strong supporting cast featuring Barbara Carrera, Laureen Landon, Alan King, Jeffrey Lewis, Paul Sorvino, who looks like my stepdad, and Judson Scott, who, it doesn't say this in the back, says has the best delivery of the word. Let's just roll the clip. Right there, Oscar, throw it at him. Uh, audio commentary by Nathaniel Thompson, nothing else, but that's okay, because that movie fucking rocks. Watch Eye the Jury if you like sleazy, skeezy, noirish, neo-noir stuff. And that's it, guys. That's my that's my that's my first Kino haul. Uh, I got another one coming. I'll do another video if y'all like this one. If you don't like it, we're just gonna ignore this and sweep it under the rug. And uh, yeah, go buy some movies you have until this date right here uh, to buy from the Kino sale. If you miss out, that's okay. They have like a million a year. Please join my Patreon. Subscribe. Hit that like button. And of course, go watch a movie.